Welcome to Spotlight ETSU. I'm your host, Carrie Oliveira. On today's program, our special guest is Dr. Daryl Carter. Dr. Carter is an assistant professor and graduate coordinator for the Department of History. He's also involved in an exciting new program at ETSU called Open Books. Welcome to Spotlight ETSU, Dr. Carter. Well, thank you for having me. We're so delighted you're here. Tell us about how you came to be at ETSU, how long you've been here. Well, I'm alumni here at ETSU, so I received my bachelor's and master's uh, here uh, many years ago. And uh, when I finished my uh, doctoral studies, I came back in 2008. So I've been here now five years. Where did you get your PhD? The University of Memphis. Oh. Yes, so here in the state, yeah. My understanding, I've been to, I've visited Memphis once. My understanding is that Memphis and East Tennessee might as well be like two different countries. If you've lived in both <laughs> places, would Abs you agree with that? Absolutely, there are two, diff two different states I in a lot of ways. I went to school in Michigan and I spent some time in Detroit. I refer to Memphis as Detroit South Campus because mm -hmm. the cities are sort of similar. They're musical and yeah. they have the same kind of flavor. Well, that's exciting. So how did, why did you decide to come back to ETSU after all that? Well, I had the opportunity to come back here and that was uh, important to me, and I uh, was very grateful for the opportunities that, uh, that my undergraduate and graduate experience provided for me. Families here, uh, my wife met uh, me here at the, and at the university, so I was uh, very eager to come back here. And uh, it's very tough in the job market. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, so when you have a tenure track opportunity, you take it. You seize it, you yes. sure do. So is that what you intended to do, like from the time that you were an undergraduate? No, no, that was not. Um, but by the end of my undergraduate studies, uh, that had become something that was frequently thought about uh, of an academic career. Oh, so you have, so you wanted to be an historian. Yes, That's, yes. And I find that fascinating. Anybody who likes history just sort of perplexes me because I've never been a fan. Well, history uh, gets a bad rap because <laughs> of bad teachers. and uh, uh, So I've heard. <laughs> yes, uh, bad teachers and uh, bad professors. Uh, but, but it's really interesting. It's really fun. And it's the original academic discipline. Uh, all the departments at ETSU came after history. Uh, because it boils down to something as simple as what happened yesterday and why. Yeah. Uh, so the issue of having uh, history uh, be fun is imperative as we move forward here as a profession. Um, it's not just about dates or figures right. or facts, but it's about context, it's about what happened, the motivations behind what happened, and no matter what you're into, whether if you like video games or you like uh, meteorology or you like uh, sports, there's a history to it. Yes. And uh, that history is important and to understand that history can help guide uh, you in making positive or, or constructive decisions in your career and your life. Well, you know, the, the, the adage about if you do not study history, you're doomed to repeat it. Right. Well, that's, that's used a little bit too much. History doesn't repeat itself. It just becomes, it just becomes eerily similar <laughs> right. um, in many situations. And we're finding that out right now as a country as we deal with uh, uh, $17 trillion in debt, uh, the debt ceiling uh, uh, possible uh, default, uh, the government shut down, um, all of these things we're dealing with right now as a result of uh, many things that have taken hundreds of years to get us to this point. You're going to explain that to me here in a second. Sure. But we're going to spend some time talking about you and what you do on this campus. So what courses do you do? What kind of, what is your particular area of historical study? I study and uh, I study and teach uh, American 20th century political history, uh, 21st century American political history. Uh, my work focuses on uh, President Clinton um, and African Americans liberalism and Senator Edward Kennedy mm -hmm. um, and general political history from the New Deal to the present. How is political history different from political science? Well, one, we actually get into what happened. Political scientists are all too often involved with their little charts and uh, <laughs> quantitative research. And uh, <laughs> we, he, he we, says to a quantitative researcher, but nonetheless. <laughs> but, but, but we involve, uh, you know, archival documents. We involve mm. oral history. We involve um, uh, popular uh, sources such as newspapers, magazines, uh, things like that, in order to develop a narrative of what took place and why. Um, the political scientists have gone too far from uh, theory into the quantitative. Let's let's right. 
be a pseudo hard science and they've lost their soul somewhat because of it. Uh, my friends in political science won't like that. Right now. But, but <laughs> it, it is a problem in that discipline. Uh, however, uh, if they would orient themselves back towards the theory part of, of their discipline, I think it would be a great Are the deal. objectives of political science and political history different ultimately? No, not necessarily. Political history is very interdisciplinary in mm. approach. So when we talk about political history, we're using historical methods, but we're also bringing in uh, sociology, political science, science business, um, anthropology at times, uh, psychology sometimes. So we're, we're an interdisciplinary discipline in, mm -hmm. in, a, in and of itself uh, within the broader field of history. Uh, how, however, uh, because of what we do, we have to incorporate uh, all kinds of other things in there, including, right. unfortunately, at times, pop psychology. You know, why is Bill Clinton a bad boy? You know, right. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's what politics is made of, right? I mean, it's the human experience, right? It's governance and whatever else, but I mean, all of all of what it is to be a human feeds into that, so it makes sense that you would. Yeah, so be it's about people. By, yeah, it's about people. Um, people uh, ignore that, but it, it is. It's about human beings. Which I, you know, I never think about history as being really about people. I think of it as being about dates. Right. And I love that you just said that you know we, we're, we're trying to construct a narrative right. about what has happened in right. you know politics or wherever it is you're studying history. And yeah, it's the story. If if I learned history like as stories, probably would have appreciated it more. Well, you know, some of uh, our friends in the profession have not done the best in terms of teaching right. uh, American history in a way that's innovative and creative and. Uh, appeals to students and that goes many decades back so um, and so the much history of history, of history. <laughs> right and because history is a humanity it often is uh, subjected to political concerns at the K through 12 level right so you can only say that you know George Washington was a great guy and you know uh, uh, the founding fathers were, were is that gentlemen. a legitimate thing no. like does this really happen no. where schools are sort of they they edit history for the sake of being politically Well, they don't correct, edit, or? well, it's not the schools themselves, it's, it's the boards of education right. at the local level because they're controlled by local people. And these people are not academics in any shape, form, or fashion, uh, even those who sometimes are attached to uh, educational institutions like Dick Manahan here at, at the u university. Um, and when you're telling, you're talking about, you know, compulsory e education, K through 12, mm -hmm. then you're involving uh, parents uh, with their little kids and right. they don't want their little kids to learn that slavery was really bad. Right. Uh, that it was really horrific. They don't want you to talk about that. So there's a whole movement that's been underway for decades now that we've really seen uh, renewed in the past five years of uh, let's sanitize history right. uh, or politicize it so that we can get our points across. For example, Governor Huckabee and the Founding Fathers being, you know, great moral men, right? Totally. I mean, how moral are you when, you know, you're having affairs, right? when you're engaged in um, some vicious political battles that um, are not always uh, above board when right. you're involved with uh, slavery, uh, which most of these guys, to one degree or another, understood was somehow wrong. Indeed, I mean, um, the selling of human beings, yeah, probably yeah. not a good idea. Um, but now they don't want you to talk about that. Right. They just want you to talk about, you know, he's a great general, right? Well, he may have been, um, but I'm not sure the uh, slaves under his control at Mount Vernon would uh, necessarily agree if they were allowed to speak openly. Right. Golly. See, so history, okay, you just made history cool for me. That's outstanding. So, you teach history on this campus. Yes. And so, what courses specifically do you teach? Well, I teach uh, the U.S. since 1877. I teach a class on President Clinton, a uh, class on President Bush. You have uh, entire courses on on presidents. On uh, presidents. I uh, taught a class this summer on uh, the Kennedy assassination. Um, Who assassinated Kennedy? <laughs> can't tell you that. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this fall I'm teaching a course for my graduate students on historical research and I teach classes in the Af African African American Studies program here uh, as well. So uh, there's a wide variety that I do teach you uh, since 1945. Um, the post-war era. So there's a number of courses I do, do uh, teach in 1970s was another course. So 
Um, you do a whole course on the 70s? Yes. You know, it's a kind of forgotten decade. People think of it in terms of it's bad hair. Because everyone was on acid. Well, <laughs> they, <laughs> they think of drugs, bad hair, uh, polyester, and, yep. and disco. And uh, what we don't realize uh, the pu as a public is that it's a very important decade in terms of uh, politics and social movements. Uh, this is where the, the, the women's movement really gets pushed, you know. Uh, uh, from the late 60s uh, as they pursued ERA and other things, mm -hmm. uh, re, uh, reproduction rights, etc. African Americans continue onward. Um, we see on the other side people like Phyllis Shafley and the conservative uh, movement pushing back against this. Right. Um, so it's a very important decade, not to mention you have President Nixon with Dayton and, you know, uh, opening up uh, China. Uh, Watergate. Yes. Uh, Reagan is, you know, pounding on the door. He ne nearly beats Ford in '76 uh, for the Republican nomination. Uh, the gas uh, shortages, stagflation, uh, Carter and Malays, you know, and and of course Iran. Um, so it's a That's very. That's a lot of stuff that happened in the yeah, '70s. It's a very important uh, decade. And then you have other cultural aspects. You know, you have like the Louds, that, that TV family, that's usually credit is the first TV reality family and you know you have this kind of uh, issue there with uh, generational aspects of it you got a kid who may be gay you have another kid who's doing this you know so you it's a very interesting thing not to mention uh, just the sports aspect of the decade um, between say uh, Muhammad Ali and um, uh, George Frazier. Right. Um, you have NASCAR that's starting to come into its own in a national sense, but it's going to take a few more years. Uh, you know, the, the Red Sox of Fisk, uh, you, you have uh, uh, Pudge, and uh, you know, you have a number of these other uh, athletic events, the Steelers, uh, and their dominance throughout the decade, the mm -hmm. Cowboys. Uh, and their dominance through most of the decade in the NFC, or what is now the NFC. So you have a number of these things that are taking place. Pornography is becoming um, not mainstream yet, but getting close, especially right. with the, uh, the release of Deep Throat. Um, so that's important as well in terms of understanding it. And it forms a lot of what we see during the Reagan era in the 80s, the pushback, the family value yes. agenda, the, the conservative political policies that are coming from the Reagan administration. Uh, and increasingly the Democratic Party and the liberals are seen as out of the mainstream. And in many cases by many people increasingly dangerous to the health of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and the toll of the assassinations of the 60s and then the problems of the 70s uh, lead us into the, the age of Reagan as some historians have called it. The age of Reagan. Right. Man, that was like synopsis of the 70s all rolled into one and like... Well, it's part of it. I mean, <laughs> still, that's a lot of stuff. And like, the, what I love about that is like context. Everything matters to everything else. Yes, it's not, it's not separate. You can't look at these things in a vacuum. Right. Um, they are important, yes, in and of themselves, but they're part of a larger picture uh, um, that we have to appreciate. Indeed. So you are also teaching, aside from the courses that you listed, you're also doing the Open Bucks course, which is a... Well, I'm not teaching that. Not teaching that. No, I'm a, I'm a director in the Office of E-Learning okay. over that. So but overseeing sort of the development and deployment yeah. of the right. Open Bucks program. So Open Bucks, tell me about Open Bucks. Open Bucks is our new uh, online program, which takes the MOOCs or the massive open online uh, courses and adapts it to the uh, purposes of ETSU. So the courses are initially free. Anybody can sign up for them. Uh, but once you finish them, if you want credit, mm -hmm. which is what we have done is create a pathway to credit, you can pay a small fee, a third of what a regular course would cost, uh, to pay for assessment, to pay for uh, the finish up coursework with it and then receive uh, three hours credit with it being transcripted so that it'll go any And do you receive a letter grade or is it a pass bill kind of thing? It'll be a letter grade. Really? So it's a very interesting program. We put a lot of work into it. We're very proud of it in e-learning. Uh, the semester is underway for Open Bucks. It started in mid-September. Mm -hmm. It'll end mid-November. Uh, mid and then we'll get into the spring probably in February. So it's like a two-month course. It's eight weeks. Okay. Yes, eight weeks, two months. And it's a very interesting uh, 
uh, program. I'm very proud of it. Um, under the leadership of Dr. Uh, Karen King, who's yeah. vice provost, uh, her and uh, the staff and uh, the faculty that were actually doing the courses had done a wonderful job. And uh, we've also been very lucky and grateful to have the full-throated support of uh, President Nolan yes. and uh, Provost Bach in doing this. And it set us apart really from the rest of the TBR institutions across the state that are really not doing this. I mean, ETSU is really innovative where TBR schools are concerned, right. sort of in general. Right, and TBR is, uh, you know, too focused uh, on RODP. Yeah. Um, and pursuing market-based solutions to educational issues, which is understandable. But what we've done is we've said we're going to take the initiative here and figure mm -hmm. out how to use this in a way that benefits our students because that's what we're trying to do is to provide a quality educational experience for students that will help them achieve their dreams, to pursue their goals, and to uh, uh, complete their education in a reasonable time period uh, with the least amount of cost possible. That is ideal. Yes. That is exactly what should drive higher education, right. I and feel like. They're at the forefront of everything we do in uh, the Office of E-Learning. And, uh, and we're very fortunate, as I say again, to have an administration that sees that as well and is uh, oriented in that direction. How many students do we have enrolled in the two open box courses we got going on right now? Right now we have around 150. Across uh, the two or in each? Across group? the two. Okay. Uh, we're very happy about that. One of the problems that we had was determining an estimate pr prior to enrollment. Right. And since there was really nobody out there doing what we were doing, we couldn't get a good... There was no benchmark. Good, really. Yeah, there was no benchmark that we can apply to. But now uh, what we're seeing is, is the enrollment is very steady that we are having constant hits uh, in terms of the website uh, daily, every day, um, hundreds of hits sometimes uh, during the, the work week. Um, people who are calling, who are emailing us, asking questions. So students are really honestly engaged they're, in course. They're engaged and, and they're trying uh, it's difficult with anything new because they're trying to figure out exactly what it is and all that. Mm -hmm. But what we know as of now is that it is successful and that it is helping students and we, we expect it to be increasingly successful as uh, time goes on. And so because we, I mean, you didn't have an estimate for how many students who would likely enroll. Right. So you probably then don't have an estimate of how many students are likely to after the fact pay for it in order to order Not yet. credit. But what is your hope? We, well, we hope anywhere from 10 to 20 percent would be willing to do that. We give them a year, which is another positive thing. So if you oh. finish next month and it doesn't, you know, you're busy, you know, your dog died or whatever, and you've got other <laughs> things going on, that's right. okay. You've got a year to do it, to come back and say, okay, here's the money, I want to do this. Um, and I think that's a real benefit to the students. Right. Uh, because you can't finish you know, my course uh, in December, as it's saying, my regular courses right now, and say, you know what, I'll, I'll pay for it when I get to uh, nope. November of next year. That's not going to work. That is not going to happen. Um, so <laughs> so it, it adds flexibility to, to what uh, we're doing and to what students need and uh, giving them additional flexibility in terms of how they, they pursue their college education. Is the hopeful objective that a student might be able to complete an entire gen ed curriculum in the open box program? We are focused on gen ed right now. Um, due to budgetary pressures, you know, we cannot do more than you right. know, a couple courses a semester online right. um, because all these courses are being constructed from scratch. Yes. So. Uh, it would be my hope that over the period of the next five to seven years we can put the entire Gen Ed online um, as I think it will be a real benefit, especially when you consider the demographics of the student body. Uh, we're 60 percent, I believe, female. Uh, we are overwhelmingly um, uh, first generation. We are overwhelmingly, uh, uh, if not first generation, then second generation. Uh, most of our students work to mm -hmm. some degree. A lot of them have families, husbands, wives, children. Um, Very non-traditional, non not, not just in terms of age, but our population, I think, is not, even the students who are of traditional college age are non-traditional as compared to the average college student, I think. We have a very unique population Yes, here. yes we do, and I think this helps with that. And, but we're not just pursuing our own students in terms of ETSU. We're, right. we're, we are advertising across the state of Tennessee, and uh, we're trying to draw other students 
uh, here uh, to Johnson City, at least online. Um, and we've had some success with that uh, in our traditional online programs as well as in open books. That is so cool. You, you're writing a couple of books, but instead of talking about the books real quickly, I've just gotten a cue to be 10 minutes left in the conversation. Sure. So I want to spend some time talking about the current state of politics in the United States of America. Okay. The government's not working. No. It's shut down. No. Okay. So I think that there's a lot of confusion about why that happened, right. what that means. We have the debt ceiling deadline right. coming up. And so could, could you contextualize sure. this for me? Well, the federal government has annually about 13 appropriation bills that have to be passed um, to, to fund the entire government. And uh, the fiscal year ends on September 30th uh, for the federal government. Most states is J June 30th. And in order for the government to continue past September 30th, they must have these funding bills uh, signed into law or what is called a continuing resolution or a CR. Mm -hmm. The a CR wasn't passed, they had extended this, um, uh, excuse me, they did not extend that, but they had uh, hoped that they can extend the debt ceiling thing a little longer. That didn't work, I'll get into that in a second. But okay. uh, in terms of the shutdown, once they didn't come to an agreement, uh, there was no money that could be spent by law, right? Right. Uh, so the government went into uh, a shutdown. Now what that meant for the public was that one, uh, you would see a drastic cutback in services yes. that the government provides. Uh, the National Parks, the National Endowment for the Humanities, NASA, National Endowment for the Arts, uh, the Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, Health and Human Services, these things would shut down. Everything uh, that's really ultimately designed to serve right. the, the American public, really. Right, and then it furloughed uh, hundreds of thousands of federal workers. Uh, but it's not a complete shutdown. There, are, there is still work going on in Washington. Um, but it's on a very skeletal crew. It's based on, and each department has these type of procedures in place to determine who's essential and who is not. Right. So the essential employees would include things like various aspects of the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, it would include principles like the FBI director who would still remain on the job. The military would still have uh, be on the job, things of that nature. So the, the shutdown is, is causing a huge problem in that we're losing hundreds of millions of dollars by one estimate a day in a shutdown, upwards of $300 million a day. We've been in a shutdown for 16 days and it's estimated. Where is that loss coming from? It, the loss is coming from, number one, employees are not getting paid. Right. But defense contractors, government contractors are not getting money either. And their workers are being laid off as well or furloughed for a period of time. So that's a, a lot of lost uh, productivity there. Uh, when people don't have that money, they can't spend it. Right. So that hurts as well. Uh, so that's in part what the government shutdown is all about. And on the debt ceiling thing, by law, you can only spend so much, mm -hmm. you know. And in order to get that raise, there has to be an act of Congress. The problem with the Republican, uh, or the Congress, I should say, is the Republican Party has decided that they would use their the debt ceiling crisis as well as the government shutdown to try to force policy changes down the throat of the administration and uh, and doing so has inflicted quite a bit of harm. Specifically policy change reported uh, regarding uh, the Affordable, the Affordable Care Act. Yeah, yes, Ob Obamacare. Indeed, which Absolutely. I refuse to refer to it as. Well, they, you, know, you know, it's a, it's a situation where they couldn't they couldn't beat Obama in, in 08, they couldn't beat him in 12, uh, they couldn't get the courts to rule unconstitutional uh, so basically what they're doing is they're saying, we're going to hold the damn country hostage, hostage until you do this, uh, until you see uh, our way through it. Um, I had colleagues who said in 2009 and 10, oh, this is no big deal, you know, the, po the political uh, brinksmanship and gr gridlock in Washington. I said, well, no, you're wrong because we've, we haven't seen anything like this since the Civil War. Uh, this is really, really bad. Right. Um, and now Americans are starting to pay the price for their choices. Um, these people, in terms of the Republican Party, uh, are really, in a way, sadistic. I mean, they, they're not about anything. They're about destruction. 
that's what makes their day. Well, and that's the thing I've been reading, you know, I spent a lot of time consuming a lot of social media and just, you know, just in an attempt to get any kind of news to stay informed as to the situation. And I run into a couple of quotes recently where Republicans have been quoted as saying, like, I, I don't even know what we're trying to accomplish, right. but surely we're going to stick to our guns until yeah. we accomplish an yeah. non-specified goal. Yeah, I don't know what the goal is, but I support it. I, yeah, exactly. And I'm uh, like, I can't, I don't even, and of course logic we, escapes me on that one. We, we see that around a lot, a lot around here, for example, you know, with the Affordable Care Act. I mean, we've got Congressman Rowe, we've got our uh, state delegation uh, to Nashville uh, talking about how evil this is, right? And of course, every uh, uh, two or three times a year, I see thousands of people lining up at RAM clinics all across southwest Virginia yes. looking for free medical care. Indeed. Uh, so I guess socialized medicine is only okay if uh, it's locally based. That's true. Uh, <laughs> Not that but if, a, but if, a, <laughs> a, if a skinny, funny looking guy uh, with a funny name named Obama puts mm. in a federal law, then there's, some, there's something wrong with Clearly that. Clearly something awry with that. Okay, so the debt ceiling allows the government to borrow money yes. in order to cover its bills because right. we only draw so much revenue from taxes and other things. Right. We really can't run the government on what we draw in taxes. Right. So the debt ceiling becomes really important to the operation of the country. Yes. So if we don't increase the debt ceiling and allow the country to bo borrow enough to cover our bills, then what happens? The, well, we will go into uh, a default. And that means that for the first time in American history, the government will have to pick and choose in terms of what bills it will pay. Will it pay Social Security? Will it pay veterans uh, benefits? Will it pay uh, other employees benefits? Will, you know, uh, will it pay this contractor or that contractor? How's it going to pay the debt that's been bought by U.S. banks, China, and, and other banks across the world? Uh, so it'll Could really legitimately debilitate the functioning of government. Yes. Well, uh, part of the consequence of this will, will probably be uh, higher interest rates. Uh, they could skyrocket overnight if it gets bad enough. Um, other issues would be people will get laid off probably in the private and public sector. Uh, the credit rating of the country will go down. Mm -hmm. um, we've already been put on warning yesterday by Fitch. Yes. Uh, so that's going to be an issue as well. It's a very negative thing. Anybody who thinks it's a good idea uh, to, uh, and there are plenty around here, uh, to just let it go into default, what's the worst that can happen? Well, it's going to be really bad. And Quite you're playing with fire. And this is not the way the Congress has behaved in the past. They right. usually have said, okay, once we have the vote secure to raise this, then go ahead and make your political point there. Yes. But we're going to pass this thing because it's too, it's too risky not to. Right. Um, and what we see is a Congress that's largely ignoring uh, the warnings from economists, from Wall Street, from others are saying this is really bad. So Wall Street hasn't failed it as much yet, but they're about to. Uh, but Main Street sure has. Yes. Yeah. So how do we end the shutdown? When, is, when are we expecting that to happen? There, what do we need to do? The House and the Senate are in discussions, but mainly Senator, uh, Senate Majority Leader Reid and Senate Minority Leader McConnell are in discussions uh, today and last night. Their staffers are putting together a framework uh, so hopefully they can come to some type of an agreement, at least in the Senate, today or tomorrow. Uh, this could drag into the weekend. Uh, the problem is, and it, and it has been all along, is the House of Representatives, they which is controlled by the Republicans. They, will they put it to a vote? Uh, Boehner is arguably one of the most weak, or one of the weakest, I should say, speakers in a long time. In, in American history, uh, for a long time. He, it's, it's, he should, his nickname should be, I can't, I don't have the votes. Because <laughs> um, he, he can't get it past his caucus. That is a brilliant and concise summary of a situation. We could talk yep. about this for days, but unfortunately we are out of time. But okay. I do appreciate the sort of like enlightenment that you had provided today. Thank you for Thank joining you. us on Spotlight ETSU. We were here with Dr. Daryl Carter from the Department of History. Join us next time on Spotlight ETSU.